right? And then today we're going to move into beta alloys and applications. So remember alpha beta uh, alloys uh, right we have a huge range of potential microstructures beta alloys and near beta alloys are, are very much very much the same um, the key thing is that they just have a higher uh, beta stabilizer content so that when we're rapidly quenched from above the transis, you end up with a structure that is uh, mostly more or less still single phase beta, whereas the, the alpha beta groups of alloys will begin to transform on quenching, right? So the rapid quench from above the transis, you got the growth of nucleation of grain boundary alpha and Vinland statin. In the beta alloys, we have enough stabilizer that you, when you come down, you're basically all uh, still in the beta phase, right? The key thing to remember is that all beta alloys are essentially metastable, right? If we hold for, if we look at the, the metastable phase diagram, Right, we will eventually get to get to other stuff. Right, beta phase, good formability, reasonable tensile strengths, poor creep resistance. Why? Right. Why was the alpha beta so much better in creep? Right. Complex, has, like, yeah, complex microstructure, low diffusion in alpha, right? So for both dislocation creep and diffusion creep, you had better resistance. Better annealing uh, as annealed, uh, much better, much better toughness. Um, these are just sort of the classes, classes of alloys. And remember, don't you don't need to memorize. Uh, alloy, alloy types, right? But what is uh, likely question, if I give a composition, right, being able to look at it and say, oh, hey, this has got a ton of beta stabilizers in it. So this is likely to be a beta alloy, right? I'm not going to say, you know, what's tie 8823, but if I give an alloy with this composition and you see, oh, eight molybdenum, eight vanadium with, with iron in there, right? This is likely to be a beta alloy. Okay, so again, taking some slides from Jim Williams, right? He defined uh, the beta alloys as, contain, as alloys that contain sufficient beta stabilizers to permit retention of beta phase when rapidly cool. Right, and so basically the beta means suppression of both martensite and the alpha phase transformation. Um, and he did mention a couple issues that need to be taken into account, that this is gonna be cooling rate dependent, right? So it depends on the size of your part, right? So there's sort of like a critical casting thickness, right, where you, can cool quickly enough to retain all beta, right? If you have a really huge block, you're not going to get the heat out of the center fast enough uh, to avoid precipitation of, um, of alpha. And then uh, stress-assisted transformation, which we're, we're, um, we're not going to be worried about, right? And as just a reminder, we basically have... Uh, Two possible uh, conditions, isomorphous beta and eutectoid type beta stabilizers, right? The isomorphous vanadium, molybdenum, uh, niobium, and tantalum are the key ones, right? Chromium and iron, tungsten are the key 
uh, the key eutectoid, right? And just a zoom in of the eutectoid phase diagram, uh, the, the eutectoid, right? Liquid directly to uh, to to beta. Okay. So eutectoid elements, right, increase the risk of, of solute segregation during ingot, ingot solidification. Now take a look at what are our eutectoid elements, right? Manganese, tungsten, iron, these are going to be significantly heavier, more, right, than uh, titanium, right? So you're going to potentially have concentration gradients during uh, during large heats, right? And this can cause a problem the composition variation called beta flecking. And I showed a little example of that on um, Friday, but basically what, what uh, beta flecking can cause, right, is if you have large local variations in the beta transis, right? If you've got uh, fluctuations in composition, you're going to have comp fluctuations in the transis, right? And if you're forging or doing heat or thermal mechanical processing near the transis, right, you could potentially have regions uh, with drastically different um, uh, microstructures, right? So you have you end up with a region that uh, transforms to completely to beta, part that stays in the uh, um, alpha to beta region, right? And localized uh, um, microstructure changes like this are going to wreak havoc on properties, right? So you're going to have basically uh, easy regions for plasticity versus soft region or hard regions for plasticity, cyclic loading, you get uh, strain localization in the easy region, easy crack initiation, right? So this, this is something that needs to be, uh, oops, right, needs to be uh, to dealt with, right? So we either have to have, um, We're not going to go through the processing, but uh, there's very there's special melt and solidification processes that that need to be followed for beta uh, um, for beta alloys. So uh, isomorphous alloying elements can be difficult to add, right? because we've got a high melting point uh, for things like vanadium and niobium, right? The same thing is sort of true for your tectoid when you have uh, tungsten in there, right? So the way this is dealt with is, is what are called master alloy classes, right? So the master alloy are high purity two or three component alloys um, that can be available in there. They're semi-finished alloys. Right, so they'll come from the melt as these master alloys to which the the processor says, processor will then out, uh, make final alloying additions of things that are easier to put in. Right. Okay. And so remember, we've got a couple phase reactions that we're interested in. Right. So we've got phase separation. Right, our beta goes to beta prime, right? Remember, beta prime is a uh, the same crystal phase, but different composition, right? And Br, which is uh, beta rich, right? And whereas in the alpha uh, 
plus beta alloys, the beta prime tended to be beta uh, rich in beta stabilizers. In highly alloyed uh, beta alloys, the beta prime is going to be lean in beta stabilizers, right? And the matrix is going to be uh, uh, rich. And just as before, the beta prime regions are going to be precursors for alpha precipitate nucleation, right? Heterogeneous nucleation, right? As we'll see as we go through this, processing the beta titanium alloys is all about making the best use of nucleation sites for alpha for strengthening, right? We have the omega reaction, and again, the omega phase is going to be. Uh, lean and beta stabilizers. So these precipitation reactions, right, are going to enrich the remaining beta matrix, right? right. The omega, very rapid reaction, high hardness because we get a very nice fine dispersion of precipitates, right? Ductility loss due to strain localization. Right, very much in line with the same things we saw with GP zones and aluminum. Right, and then we have uh, alpha precipitation. Right, uniform nucleation is hard to achieve. We have heterogeneous nucleation. Right, so if we're going right from beta to alpha, what are going to be potent heterogeneous nucleation sites? So the beta beta grain boundaries for one, right? But we is that something we're gonna want? Right? If we have a beta alloy, do we want to decorate just the, the grain? Are we gonna want to decorate the, the beta grain boundaries with alpha? Right? No. Right? We want to try and get a, as heterogeneous a distribution as possible. I mean a homogeneous distribution as possible. So that means we're gonna to want to take advantage of Nucleation at dislocations, subgrain boundaries, right? Uh, take advantage of omega to alpha and beta, beta prime to alpha, right? All right, because we, we want to avoid the non uniform distribution of alpha phase precipitates. Beta prime, right? Again, very similar to GP zones in conception, right? If we look, this is a micron here, right? So if that's a micron, these are five to 10 nanometers, sort of particle size, right? Uniform distribution. There is going to be a couple different ways that these, these can form. Uh, uh, titanium molybdenum is actually a spinodal decomposition, right? Um, right? And there's still a lot of research going on, sort of about what's what's actually happening here. What are the nucleation mechanisms? What are the the uh, um, stability? But other alloying elements can greatly affect the stability. How fast these can re-dissolve what the critical radius is going to be and how potent nucleation sites they are for other uh, for other elements, right? And right, <clears throat> unlike aluminum, right, this will behave more like steel because we're going to be very dependent on cooling rate, right, for different for different microstructures. Right, we didn't talk much about cooling rate with aluminum. We, we talked about aging temperatures, right? Steels, we talked a lot about cooling rate. Titanium is also going to be, right? So if we go, this is, I think, yeah, this is 5553, five, right? So five aluminum, five vanadium, five molybdenum, three chromium, and, and a little bit of iron, right? If we Take it to the beta transis, plus 50, and then furnace cool, so slow cooling. We get a uh, structure that looks 
a basket weave type structure that looks very much like what we saw for the alpha beta alloys. If this were an alpha beta alloy and we did a slow furnace cool, what would our microstructure look like? Would it be a basket weave? Slow cooling of alpha beta alloy would have a uh, well-defined colony structure with large, with a completely uh, um, covered uh, prior beta grain boundaries with a thick layer of grain boundary, grain boundary alpha, right? If we force air cool or oil quench, we uh, retain um, fully beta, uh, Microstructure, you can't see it, but oil quench is fast enough to produce um, athermal omega, right? So it's almost like the Martin site because it's athermal, but it's it's the omega phase. It's not it's not the uh, the Martin site phase, right? And this just shows the the uh, how fine these omega phase is, right? Right. This is a 50 nanometer bar, right? So these are two to three nanometer size uh, um, omega regions, right? And if we age, we coarsen to say five to 10 uh, from five to 10. If we fast cool and then age, Right, so this is uh, the heat heat treatment scheme is up here, right? So we're above the transist for an hour. Oil quench age at six 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 sixty for four hours, and then oil quench again. Right, we get a, a very fine dispersion of. Uh, alpha, right? You can see the uh, the platelets. If we do the same thing and then furnace cool, right? We still have a uh, it's finer, much finer than if we were in a furnace cool from the transis, but we still have a but it's relatively relatively coarser, right? And if we take a look at comparison between the alpha and beta alloys and beta, right? So here's, right, typical, uh, uh, alpha type, bal uh, type beta structure. Here's our beta, right? Right, we still have, uh, we still have alpha, but it's a, a much, much finer, uh, much finer scale, right? So huge, huge influence on mechanical properties, right? Anyone want to hazard what the primary? Primary differences are right. This is a good, good questions to ponder. Right. So again, be careful interpreting these because electron micrographs, right? Our contrast is different. Right. So here we see uh, this is optical etch. So the light regions are alpha, and the dark is beta. Here. The dark is alpha and the light is light is beta, right? So don't be fooled by the contrast. You just have to have to remember what we're what we're looking at. So what's the what's the mechanism for this fine dispersion? Not not homogeneous, right? We don't have 
don't have time for that. Right? Right. So we basically said uh, that on oil quench, we get a fine dispersion of omega. Right? So this is heterogeneous of alpha at, uh, at omega. Right? The omega phase has a strong influence. Um, on alpha, same thing with the uh, beta prime or beta one phase. Right. Right. So this is just an example of alpha phase nucleation at the beta prime. Right. So if we can nucleate alpha at the beta prime, we get a fairly uniform precipitate distribution. Um, Right, we want to. We're going to minimize the grain boundary alpha, but this this is going to require a long low temperature age. Right, the beta prime requires uh, uh, segregation. Right of the um, beta stabilizing elements. Right away from the beta prime into the matrix. Right, so it re and requires lower temperatures, so that means we need sort of a long time low temperature age, right, which makes it um, uh, economically not the not the most favorable. Omega phase, on the other hand, this transformation is short range atomic. Movements. Remember, we looked at those animations. That was collapse of the BCC to omega by the the shifting. Right, we had A, B, C layers. Right, the A and the B and the C layers. Those atoms collapsed onto one to give us the simple hexagonal from the BCC. So this is a uh, fairly rapid reaction. It happens nearly athermally, and then you have diffusion out right so this is in some ways very much like the, like bainite in steel right you have a, a transformation that that goes by coordinated atomic motion and then diffusion of the carbon out here we have collapse of the bcc structure into the the simple hexagonal or non-close packed hexagonal and then beta stabilizers uh, uh, come out, and this is really beneficial, as we said before, for distribu uniform distribution of uh, alpha lats, right? So it's heterogeneous nucleation. Here we see that should be an alpha, not oh, this alpha is a check mark, right? So here we see alpha nucleating on uh, the omega phase. And you'll notice that a lot of these micrographs are from Thai 5553, and that was because uh, these all, all the micrographs came from Professor Frazier, right? He had a large Air Force contract for many years with Thai 5553. So there's been a lot of work specifically looking at the omega nucleation and, uh, um, and this growth. Okay, so a different alloy here, right? This alloy, we don't form the omega on the uh, the oil quench, right? But, again, the story is going to be heterogeneous nucleation, right? So if we have uh, material that's been worked rather than just quenched, so worked and aged versus quenched and aged, you can see that in the work condition, we get lots of alpha nucleation, right? So where is the, nucle where is the nucleation occurring here? Right. So for cold working or warm working, 
aging at 650 for an hour, where's our, where's our alpha nucleating? Oh, come on, it's Monday, but it's not that much of a Monday. Dislocations. That's, I heard Noah say it. Or someone who sounded like Noah. <laughs> it came from that general area. All right, this is, this is uh, uh, nucleation at dislocations. <coughs> right, noticed in the quenched in age case, we're starting to nucleate brain boundary alpha. Right? So, so heterogeneous nucleation uh, is going to be much more rapid than uniform nucleation, right? If we're fully recrystallized and recovered, so if we have a well annealed structure, we're not going to be able to avoid grain boundary alpha. So a low temperature age, the inclusion of a low temperature age is going to pr help promote our uniform nucleation, both at the beta prime or beta one site or the omega sites, right? And so we're going to have to really make good use of our processing and heat treatment to produce, to uh, produce uniform, uniform structures. Right. This is just another picture of uh, heterogeneous nucleation of, of alpha nucleation at dislocations and subboundaries. Right. I threw this slide in here because molybdenum uh, is added to some of these alloys to slow recrystallization kinetics. Right, if we can slow recrystallization, right, we maintain a dislocated structure, so we have better, uh, better uh, alpha nucleation sites. Right. So what other? Right. So again, this becomes analogous to uh, high strength, low alloy steels. Right. If we add enough vanadium and titanium to our steel, we could delay recrystallization, right? And get, uh, in that case, we were going for directional properties because we had long pancake grains rather than equiaxed, right? So the, the end goal is different, but playing with alloying elements to alter the, uh, Kinetics of different uh, structural microstructural transformations, right, is a theme that keeps coming up again and again and again during alloying and processing, right? Okay. So grain boundary alpha, right? The big problem is uh, a loss in uh, toughness, because now we've got clean, connected, percolating fracture paths through our structure uh, along the grain boundaries, right? right? So if the key things that we want to avoid is right, minimize our recrystallization and minimize <clears throat> the beta grain boundaries as potential nucleation sites. So if we want to avoid Grain, uh, grain boundary alpha. We need more potent nucleation sites than the, than the, than the beta grain boundaries. And so we can see right. This is just the kinetics, right? So heterogeneous nucleation versus uh, uh, uniform uniform nucleation, right? So if we have uh, enough 
alpha nucle potential nucleation sites, we can come down through and we can miss the curve of this. Right? If so, we don't, right, if we don't have enough heterogeneous nucleation sites, we're going to come down. And if we miss the nose here, we're going to come down into the omega, into the omega region. Yeah. So if you have enough alpha sites, you'll have the Well, so this is almost like straight down. If, yeah, this could basically you miss both of these, you'll end up uh, depending on the alloy. If you have um, too many, if you have enough beta stabilizers, you'll just remain as pure beta. If you're at the lower end in the near beta alloys, you'll end up with martensite, a fine a fine dispersion of alpha prime or alpha double. So this line here, what, what you're going to get is, is going to be very strongly dependent on where in that near beta to beta that you, that you fall under, right? But the key thing is generally in terms of if you're thinking about uniform nucleation, the omega nose is going to stick out farther, right? So if you cool fast enough to avoid here, you're going to end up transforming to beta, I mean to omega. Right, fine omega dispersion. Then, if you hold, you're going to get right. So there's different strategies, uh, right? And these are just a bunch of examples of um, uh, different different heat treatments, right? So again, this is back to five 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 three oil quench. Right, so we've got omega and then single age, we're going to have alpha nucleating from the, the omega, right? So fairly lower strength and moderate uh, ductility. I'm going to put up uh, an update to this because I forgot to change these KSIs to actual useful units, right? To MPA, so I can I can't think in KSI. I can't think in, in, in English units for mechanical properties. It, it, right. This is the one on the left was omega. Yeah, this is gonna you're gonna have because it's it's five 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 three is the alloy we are talking about where you. Right, oil quench, we came down right into the uh, the omega region. So in this structure, we're gonna have a fine fine omega dispersion, right? Aging for an hour, we get a nice uh, this is furnace cooled, right? Furnace cooling, we get a basket view structure. Right, we're going to have uh, higher strength, but similar similar uh, ductility. Right, duplex treatment. Right, oil quench. Right, we're going to cool and then age. Right. Furnace cool and age, we're going to develop the, the alpha more oil quench and age is when we talked about an oil quench age and then furnace cool. Right. But notice here we get very good strengths, right? But they're very brittle. Right, we don't have a lot of, uh, right, we got a ton of obstacles. Right, we don't have a lot of ductility that we can get, that we can get out of these. Right, and then people spend a lot of time trying to, to optimize these by going into to triple heat treatments. This is sort of more for information. Don't spend time, don't spend a lot of time, uh, 
studying this, but the key idea here being there's a lot you can do um, by playing with the thermal mechanical processing to really alter uh, right alter the strength and you can do things like tailor the size of precipitation right you, these are basically additional Bidman stat growth that that you're trying to get in the low temperature age. Right, that's going to uh, um, alter your properties, right? So you've got a huge number of knobs that you can play with with the, uh, the beta alloys, right? Okay, so these are, this is just the list of, of, uh, of common alloys. Some of them are not available anymore, right? Again, I don't expect you, you don't have to write these down. You don't have to have them to be able to recall them, right? But the question, likely questions are, I may give you two titanium alloys, right? and know what your alpha stabilizers are, your beta stabilizers are, and be able to characterize the beta stabilizers by isomorphous and eutectoid, right? So I can give you something that falls clearly into one category or the other based on the alloying elements there. You should be able to make a reasonable guess as to which, right, what it's going to be, because then I can say, right, a, a question along the lines of I give an alloy and say that it's heated above transits 50 degrees and then furnace cooled, right? For the two alloys, sketch the difference, right? Or above and then uh, um, oil quenched, right? And an alpha plus beta alloy and a beta, a strongly beta, uh, an alloy with a lot of beta stabilizers are going to look, look, uh, quite quite uh, um, difference in there. So properties of beta alloys, right? right? Just mechanical properties, but stress corrosion resistance, right? Um, reason, better spring back behavior, right? It can be formed uh, super plastic. Right, but it's uh, reasonable hydrogen tolerance. We didn't really talk about these, but sort of important to keep in mind when thinking about titanium alloys in the future. Right, not not necessarily exam questions. Right, so I don't. Okay. So, what? Where do beta alloys? Uh, tend to end up, right? So they don't have the creep resistance that an alpha plus beta microstructure is going to have, right? So we're not going to see these being used in uh, the turbine itself, but they still have a lot of aircraft uh, applications, right? Where we need high strength, low density. So regions where high specific strength is important, right? Potential uh, resistance to hydrogen embrittlement and things that can potentially be damage tolerant. So that makes it perfect for things like landing gear applications, right? Where you might get little nicks and scratches, right? You might have potential crack nucleation sites, right? But are still going to be high strength. Uh, High strength, low weights. Right. Rotor forgings, right? So this is basically the hub where the propeller blades attach, right? 
this fails, blades go off. That's not a good thing for a helicopter, right? That's the thing that scare me about helicopters, right? Is you have so many single points of fail catastrophic failure. <coughs> um, it's it's interesting. So I think. I forget the exact number, but if you think of a fixed wing aircraft, you have so many hours of flight for every one hour of maintenance. And with helicopters, it's the other way around. You have so many hours of maintenance for every hour of flight. It's, it's, uh, it's sort of the other sort of confusing. So, Uh, fittings, hinges, right? Things that see a lot of wear um, that are not so suitable for aluminum, right? You can imagine cargo door hinges, right? Something that you want to save weight wherever possible, but if you make them out of aluminum, they're just going to wear out, wear out too quickly. Are perfect places to put um, uh, titanium. Right. Nut clips. Does anyone have any idea what these are? Right. So if you have um, two pieces of sheet metal that you want to make a non-permanent joint, right? <laughs> You could bolt them together, but then you need access to the back side, right? To be able to get a nut and washer off. If you only have access to one side, you can use nut clips. So you drill through both sheets and then you put the little clip on the one, on the, this on the one and it holds your nut, the nut in place. So you can then bolt the two pieces of sheet metal together and still be able to get them apart without having access to the back side, right? Where is this important, right? Access panels on aircraft, right? If you have equipment you need to get to, but you want a nice flat surface, right? You've got countersunk screws on the outside surface, a nut clip on your inside piece of sheet metal, right? <clears throat> Easy to replace, stays stays in place if you over tighten it and strip it out you don't have to replace the skin metal you just throw away this nut clip and put a new one in titanium is fantastic because um, it doesn't form a corrosive couple with aluminum right in the way that steel would so that means you don't have to cadmium plate them and on a, say, a 747, there'll be 20,000 of these things. So weight, right? Individually, they don't weigh much, but 20,000 of them do, right? So it's a seemingly minor application, but really economically uh, um, important. Beta alloys can also be cast, right? So they're not necessarily just uh, forged, forged applications. Right. Biomedical applications, right? So very, um, very important applications, right? They're biocompatible, right? <laughs> Beta is also lower modulus than the alpha alloys. And by clever alloying, you can even get uh, uh, um, even lower modulus, right? So here's Pi 6, 4, Young's modulus of 110, get down into the low 70s. Why is modulus important? Low modulus important for biomedical applications. Hmm. 
Yeah. Bone, right? Yeah. So you need you want your stiffness to not be. Ideally, it would be a perfect match for bone, right? Right. Because right, bone isn't constant, right? It's constantly uh, remodeling, right? Right. So it's a living tissue, right? So it adjusts to the stress levels that it sees, right? And when you have a stress mismatch. You end up with bone growth that is different, bone remodeling that is different than around a implant than it would be uh, 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 if it wasn't, right? So ideally, high strength, low modulus, <laughs> biocompatible, right? These are the perfect, uh, perfect sort of things. Uh, corrosion resistant, right? Uh, not susceptible to, to hydrogen embrittlement, and it plays nice with um, uh, the ceramics that are used, right? So with alumina and uh, yttria stabilized uh, zirconia, YSZ, are often used as part of uh, biomedical impacts for the knee joint, right? You'll have the implant, which is titanium, a ceramic, ball and then a uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene uh, pad for basically for to give you your friction as the act like the, art, the artificial cartilage in your real in your uh, in your real knee right so it plays nice with with all of those right? so we are perfectly on time to wrap this up. Right. Beta titanium applications, they're, they're still more, I would say, targeted applications, right? Their use is not growing in the same way that 6.4 is, right? 6.4 is being used, used everywhere, right? If, if you have, um, you know, anyone who has any knowledge of metallurgy and you ask them for a titanium alloy, they're going to say 6.4. Chances are they're not going to be able to name a beta alloy. Right? Right. Yeah. Is that just because 6.4 can be cast and then you don't have to go through all the thermal mechanical processing? <clears throat> well, it's just because the traditional application for titanium is high, is high specific strength, right? High strength, low density. Right, and the alpha plus beta alloys give you that easily. Right, right. Plus, you have uh, better creep resistance. Right, better high temperature. Right. So, if you just think of what the traditional use case is for titanium uh, was, right, the alpha plus beta alloys, the sort of, sort of. Uh, um, where uh, fit, right? So, um, propagation rates are a little higher than alpha plus beta alloys. Good opportunities in things like springs, shear loaded fasteners, right? Still problems with processing your tectoid elements, right? Um, cost. Right, this is where your comment comes in. It's more expensive to produce beta titanium alloys in the structure that you want, right? Um, versus the alpha plus uh, um, beta alloys. There's a, a whole ton of alloys that are listed there. Each sort of has their niche application. So that means it's always being processed in small batches, which are gonna drive the cost. Uh, the cost up, right? So basically, beta tie has a huge range of, of possibilities. So you can tell, actually, so, so you notice this, right? So this, again, the couple slides from Jim Williams, you can tell because they're all in Comic Sans, which tells you that he's like old. There's something about that age, like that's 70 plus 
age where they all like a lot of like very smart people all latched on to Comic Sans as a way of lightening up <laughs> their presentation. Uh, so I don't I just want don't want you to think that it was my choice. <laughs> right, I don't want you to hold that against me. Right. But basically the big thing, a huge range of properties possible, but you have to be very thoughtful about alloying and processing, right? Because the potential for error is is huge, right? So that that wraps up um, wraps up titanium, right? We went through it quickly. There's a lot of material there, but we were able to go through it quickly because basically everything was analogous to transformations that you already learned and know. So when studying this, the key thing to keep in mind is just where's the analogy. Right, and if you have that, then then you have everything for titanium. I'll be recording a lecture on nickel and po posting that most likely uh, Wednesday, and then uh, we'll see you in a week. Have a good Thanksgiving, everybody. <coughs>